In 1975, the Miami Dolphins faced their greatest challenge. Gone were Zonka, Kick, and Warfield, and Manny Fernandez missed most of the season. Gone with injuries were Bob Hines, Dick Anderson, and middle linebacker Nick Bonaconti. In their places were the fresh faces of untested rookies and eager second-year men. And, of course, the man behind these men was head coach Don Shula, who, along with defensive coaches Don Dahl, Mike Scarry, and Tom Keene, developed capable new starters, like defensive tackle Randy Crowder, number 74, the sugar bear who proved he could bite. Nineteen seventy four's first round draftee Don Reese, number seventy six, was shifted between end and tackle and became an intimidator wherever he lined up. With such a young pair of defensive starters, it was all the more important to have experience at the defensive end positions. An injury plagued Bill Stanfield, number 84, with his seven years of experience, and Vern Den Herder, number 83, with his five years of experience, gave the Dolphins perfect balance in the defensive line. Den Herder, in fact, led the team in sacks with 11. Among the veteran linebackers, Mike Colon began the season in the middle position and made plays all over the field. But then, even Captain Crunch had to yield to an injury. Medical student Doug Swift, number 59, returned from an injury to resume his sure tackling style on the outside. And number 53, Bob Matheson, at a sprightly 30 years of age, became the senior member of the Dolphins' youthful defensive core. Along with the three veteran linebackers were three outstanding rookies. Number 56, Steve Toll, set a Dolphin record with 164 tackles or assists. Toll, Ernest Roan, and Bruce Elia showed everyone that Dolphin linebacking will be in capable hands for years to come. When injury struck the defensive backfield, second-year cornerback Jerris White, number 41, started the last five games. While at strong safety, Charlie Babb became a respected hitter. Fiery cornerback Tim Foley has fought off injuries throughout his six-year career. But when he's in the game, everyone knows he gives everything he's got. One man who remained reasonably healthy was number 45, cornerback Curtis Johnson, who enjoyed one of his finest seasons. While interceptions were accumulated by seven different members of the Dolphin defense, six were stolen by ball-hawking free safety Jake Scott, number 13, who set a Dolphin career record of 35. Despite the fact that every segment of the team was racked by injuries, the Dolphins' defensive coaching staff rearranged old pros, young pros, rookie draftees, and free agents, and came up with an ever-flexible unit which ranked third in the AFC in overall defense and allowed the fewest touchdown passes in the entire NFL. By hitting 13 field goals in 16 attempts, Garo Yepremian led the league in kicking percentage. The Dolphin passing game also led the league with 61% completions. 
some of those to punt a halfback Larry Seipel in third down situations. Jim Mandage came up with his share of clutch catches, while Bob Greasy's leading receiver was again the second year man from Florida, Nat Moore, number 89. Contrasted with the young and speedy Nat Moore on one flank, was original Dolphin Howard Twilley on the other. What Twilley lacked in youth and speed, he compensated with experience and sure hands. And then there was Freddie Solomon, the former quarterback from Tampa, whom personnel director Bobby Bethard calls one of the most exciting players to come out of college in the last five years. Because of injuries and defections, the offense required constant adjustment by offensive coaches Monty Clark, Howard Schnellenberger, and Carl Tassett. At the halfback position, Mercury Morris rushed for 875 yards and four touchdowns, and often injured Benny Malone added 220 more. At fullback, newly acquired Norm Bullard shared time with the human bowling ball, Don Nottingham, who usually was called upon for the tough down-in-the-dirt yardage needed for a first down. Nottingham also tied a Dolphin record with 12 rushing touchdowns. In passing situations, Boo was called in, and he accounted for five touchdowns. In all, the nottingham Bulash tandem gained 1,027 yards rushing and scored 22 touchdowns. Most important were the unseen heroes of the offensive line. All pro right guard Larry Little, left tackle Wayne Moore, and all pro left guard Bob Kuchenberg. The man in the middle, all-pro center Jim Langer. And the other original Dolphin, right tackle Norm Evans, number 73. These are the men of the offensive line who are visible only when leading a sweep and never when they're doing their accustomed and necessary dirty work in the trenches, protecting the quarterback or throwing an invisible block to make a touchdown possible. It is the usually invisible heroes like Norm Evans, number 73, that make the Miami Dolphins the powerful offensive force that they invariably are. A 31-game home winning streak had been snapped by Oakland in the season opener. And in the second week, things didn't look much better, as the New England Patriots led at halftime 14 to nothing. Then Don Nottingham bowled over the Patriots with a 40-yard run, and the Dolphins were on their way. Nottingham rolled up 120 yards. Yepremian kicked three field goals and the Dolphins had their first victory of the season, 22 to 14. The following week, the Dolphins made their first visit ever to legendary Green Bay, Wisconsin, and the Miami ground game, featuring Don Nottingham and Mercury Morris, continued to roll. Between them, Morris and Nottingham rushed 52 times for 232 yards. And Nottingham scored three times on the way to an impressive win over the Packers, 31 to seven. Back home the next week against the Philadelphia Eagles, the running attack continued to click. 
I just work as hard as I can and never look back, said Don Nottingham, who this time was joined by former Eagle fullback Norm Boulash. The Dolphins again rushed for more than 200 yards and won their third straight, 24 to 16. At Shea Stadium in week five, the rain and wind made it seem unlikely that anyone would have a good day. But the Dolphins continued to power their way through the opposition, accumulating 261 yards on the ground, while the New York Jets were able to accomplish little or nothing. Miami's rebuilt defense forced beleaguered Joe Namath and the Jets into no less than eight turnovers, including six interceptions, three of them by alert cornerback Curtis Johnson, number 45. Don Shula and his staff got an almost perfect game from both defense and offense. In less than three quarters, Bob Greasy ran for one score and passed for three others as the Dolphins won their fourth straight and handed the Jets their worst loss in 12 years, 43 to nothing. Next came a trip to Buffalo, where O.J. Simpson and the Bills ran up a 13 to nothing first quarter lead. While O.J. and his friends were impressive, the Dolphins ate up almost twice as much territory on the ground, gaining well over 200 yards rushing for the fifth consecutive week. Behind for almost the entire game, Bob Greasy time and again brought the Dolphins back. With 125 left, Don Nottingham blasted in for his third touchdown of the day. And the Dolphins had once again outlasted the Bills 35 to 30. Things were a little easier the next week in Chicago, where Bob Greasy had one of his best days ever, passing for 288 yards and three touchdowns in just over three quarters of play. The Dolphins won their sixth straight, going away. Then came the home rematch with the Jets, and this time Joe Namath got New York out ahead. Early in the second half, two big plays won the game for Miami. First, Bob Greasy found Norm Boulash going deep. The 59-yard score by Boulash put the Dolphins in the lead for the first time. And then, just two minutes later, Freddie Solomon returned a punt 50 yards to clinch Miami's seventh consecutive victory and a two-game lead over second-place Buffalo in the AFC East. Week number nine found the Dolphins in Houston for their next to last road game of the season. The surprising Oilers were six and two and challenging everyone. And now it was the Dolphins' turn to be challenged. In the second quarter, Bob Greasy withstood the Oiler rush long enough to launch a pass to tight end Jim Mandich. The diving catch by Mandich even the score, but only until Houston's number 84, Billy White Shoes Johnson, could get his hands on the ball.
Johnson's 83-yard spectacular put Houston ahead 13 to 6. But once again, Bob Greasy brought the Dolphins back. Benny Malone's touchdown tied the score again at 13, and then a reverse from Greasy to Malone to Freddie Solomon gained 35 yards and set up the go-ahead touchdown. Unfortunately for the Dolphins, two blocked extra points held the lead down to an uncomfortable six points, and then came another of the game's key plays. Charlie Babb's apparent game-saving interception was wiped out by a defensive holding penalty, and the Oilers were awarded a first down at the Miami 7. Then, with just 1-11 left, a running back named Ronnie Coleman did in the Dolphins. Despite a heroic performance by the entire team, Miami's seven-game winning streak was ended. But tragedy struck the following week in the Orange Bowl when Bob Greasy's season came to an end. In the first half against the Baltimore Colts, Greasy led the Dolphins to a seemingly effortless 14-2 lead. But then it happened. Bob Greasy later described the incident in these words. I was scrambling, and then I tried to run, and the tendon in my toe just gave out. The following Monday night, Earl Morrill got the call, and as Coach Shula said later, the old man got out of his rocking chair and did an outstanding job. Using young players like tight end Andre Tillman, along with wily old pros like Howard Twilley, Morrill completed a team record 13 consecutive passes and defeated the New England Patriots 20 to seven. Unfortunately, Morrill suffered ligament damage in his left knee. And once again, the Dolphins were faced with a critical loss. Half of the previous year's starters on both offense and defense were gone. And now the all-important quarterback position was passed to a young man named Don Strock, who was given his first professional starting assignment the following week against the second place Buffalo Bills. Brock ran for one touchdown and completed 11 straight passes, including two touchdowns to Howard Twilley, as the Dolphins ran up a commanding halftime lead. In the second half, Joe Ferguson, O.J. Simpson and company, made a game of it. O.J.'s 62-yarder brought the Bills within three at 24 to 21. But once again, the Dolphins had the answer in Don Nottingham, who went 56 yards midway in the fourth period to seal Miami's 12th consecutive victory over Buffalo, 31 to 21. The Dolphins now held a two-game lead over Buffalo and a one-game lead over Baltimore. But in order to clinch their fifth straight division title, they still had to defeat the hottest team in the NFL. Winners of seven straight games, the sky-high Colts, led by quarterback Burt Jones, were a team which had to be reckoned with. a scoreless first half, the opportunistic Dolphins, led by quarterback Don Strock, scored the game's first touchdown on a sweep by Mercury Morris.
in the fourth quarter, Lydell Mitchell tied it for Baltimore and set the stage for one of the sport's most dramatic sudden death finishes. As the Chesapeake Bay fog rolled in, the figures on the field took on the guise of ghostly apparitions. And Burt Jones needed 96 yards to realize his impossible dream. Possible dream had suddenly become reality for the Baltimore Colts and an unforgettable nightmare for the Miami Dolphins. The Dolphins had to win their final game against Denver to clinch a tie for the division title. And Don Shula recalled Earl Morrill in the second half. Knee brace and all, Morrill used rookies and veterans alike to lead the Dolphins back from a 10-0 deficit to a 14-13 lead over the Denver Broncos. But with just three seconds left, the outcome still was in doubt. Number 44, rookie safety man Barry Hill had blocked the 35-yard kick and preserved the Dolphins' 10th victory of the season. The same Barry Hill who had won the Tommy Fitzgerald Award as the outstanding rookie in the Dolphins' training camp. As Miami's managing general partner Joseph Robbie said, the Miami Dolphins have had six great seasons since the present coaching staff took over. But this was their greatest coaching achievement. Despite adversity of every conceivable kind, and despite an ever-changing lineup of names unfamiliar to most of the football world, Don Shula's Dolphins maintained their record of winning at least 10 games every season under Shula's leadership. They still possessed the NFL's best record since the 1970 merger. And they were just one blocked extra point from making the playoffs again. For Don Shula's remarkable no-name Dolphins, it was truly the year that ended too soon.